Thank you very much, Dr. Quan Cao. Now we're going to go into the organizational trajectory of the Kuomintang Party's nature in Taiwan. Dr. Chung Li Wu will, will make the presentation. Hi. Uh, thank you for, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Rowe's introduction. And uh, I'm more than happy uh, having this opportunity to uh, present uh, this paper. Uh, before I get down to business, I have to express my deep uh, appreciations and uh, gratitude to uh, ICCAS and others to, um, for all of the logistics uh, for this conference. And uh, uh, in this paper, uh, as the Professor Kao has already mentioned about the historical approach uh, about Taiwan's uh, development, economic uh, growth, uh, local democratization and self-government, constitutionalism, so on and so forth. So uh, in this paper, I'm only focusing on uh, uh, party dimension. And uh, I would like to start uh, my paper with a quotation from the, a very famous book. The title is uh, Semi-Sovereignty People, <coughs> written by uh, E. Shea Schneider in 1960. And E. Shea Schneider, he defined uh, the concept of uh, democracy is conf uh, conflict, uh, competition, organization, leadership, and the responsibility are the ingredients of a working definition of democracy. And democracy in a political system in which the people have a choice among the alternatives created by competing <coughs> political organizations and the leaders. I like this definition very much and actually it explains the whole political development uh, in Taiwan in the uh, past couple decades. And, um, um, you know, um, the basic idea I'm trying to talk about uh, in this paper is uh, since uh, the third wave of uh, democratization since the mid-1970s uh, from uh, Eastern uh, Europe to Latin America uh, to uh, East Asia, and there is the one common characteristics of the third wave democratization, that is incumbent political parties cannot hold the dominant positions and always replaced by uh, the uh, political opposition. But uh, in Taiwan, I mean, that is a kind of a deviant case. Uh, unlike other countries in counter uh, regime collapse, uh, the KMT still maintain its uh, strong political influence since the democratic uh, transition began. Although it lost uh, its governing power from years of 2000 through 2008. So, uh, the core question uh, in this paper, in this paper, is with the uh, social searching for uh, democratic change. How can the KMT uh, remain uh, the political power when facing a structural transformation of political leaders and the legal orders? And uh, to uh, answer uh, this question. Uh, I would like to analyze the process of transformation for uh, the KMT uh, based on four, the following four dimensions. Uh, the first, first one, I'm going to uh, roughly look at the uh, ideology of uh, political leadership. The second one, I'm going to look at the party structure uh, within the KMT. And then the third one, I would like to uh, uh, briefly introduce the elite composition uh, of the KMT, and the last one will be talking about uh, the KMT's policy toward uh, the political opposition. Okay, um, before uh, I get down to business to uh, these four factors, I would like to uh, roughly uh, introduce about the background. Actually, uh, Professor Rogue and Professor Kao already mentioned parts of that. And the Taiwan, um, uh, historically, uh, Taiwan uh, was a uh, peripheral uh, part of China. And um, uh, in uh, 1895, because of the China and the Japan's uh, 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 conflict, and the Chi uh, China government decided to uh, give Taiwan to uh, Japan, so Tai uh, Taiwan become a, a Japanese colony. And um, occupied, Taiwan was occupied uh, by Japan uh, from uh, 1895 to uh, 19. Uh, 45 uh, by the end of uh, World War II. 
So uh, in uh, 1949, uh, the KMT government retreated to uh, mainland, from mainland China to Taiwan after it was defeated by the Communist Party. So, um, so when the Chiang Kai-shek's government moved to Taiwan in 1949 to, until he died in uh, 1975, that is a type of a typical authoritarian rule under the one-party system. You know, uh, we also have the martial law from uh, 1948 to uh, 1987 because of the Chinese Civil War, by the excuse of the Chinese Civil War. And uh, besides that, uh, uh, especially Chiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, uh, Chiang Jing-guo, he, he pushed, he did initiate some reforms since the 1950s, or aims to strengthen the KMT's legitimacy and to, to attain political power, and both nationally and locally, and by enforcing of uh, emergency decree, the KMT have um, just maintained its dominant power in political affairs since the 1980s. And um, the following one is the uh, the KMT's authoritarian regimes began to show some signs of uh, relaxation uh, in the 1970s when the Chiang Kai-shek's son, Chiang Jing-guo, succeeds to be the political leader. And uh, in the late period of Chiang Jing-guo's presidency, uh, martial law was established in uh, 1987, and the competitions among political parties uh, began. Uh, however, uh, the KMT still re, uh, re, uh, maintains a dominant advantage of resources, including uh, political resources, uh, social resources, and economic resources. Of course, somebody uh, were talking about some uh, local factions, especially the relations between the KMT and local factions. I'm not, but I'm not going to talk about uh, this part uh, today. And uh, one uh, essential uh, factor for Taiwan's uh, uh, Democratic transition is the democratization within the KMT. Um, so uh, fo the following one, I'm going to talking about the uh, the uh, ideology of uh, party leadership of the uh, KMT's uh, three leaders. Um, generally speaking, we will say the leadership's factors are always uh, important in the process of democratization. So I would like to cite uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, the quotation uh, by the Samuel Huntington. He said, reflecting on uh, the diversity of society that have democratic um, governments, uh, democratization is related to the strategy available to those who seek a democratic resolution, revolution. Uh, this advice appropriately highlights the crucial role of the leadership and the political skills in bringing about democracy. It means that political leaders does matter, I mean, in the whole process. So uh, I roughly comparing uh, the three uh, presidents, Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Jing-guo, and Li Denghui. I would say that Chiang Jing-guo, he is a kind of the heart, I mean, under his rule is a kind of a heart authoritarian, and Chiang Jing-guo will be kind of a soft authoritarian. And within the uh, uh, Li Denghui's leadership, that will be kinds of the weak democracy. How can we know that is kind that is kinds of a type? So I, I uh, roughly to do some quotation about uh, those three leaders. I mean their public expression about their idea about Taiwan's democracy. Uh, you know, uh, to those people in Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek is pretty much like a guard-like figure. I mean, he is a uh, have people have guard. I mean, so to us, he, I mean, he is a kind of a paramount. I mean, he's a pretty much, he's a, of course, he's an important, political important. And characteristic of Chiang Kai-shek's re regime from uh, 1949 to uh, 1970, 1975. Actually, the structure is pretty similar to a uh, Leninist party system, <laughs> except there are two pretty important uh, differences from the Leninist party. The first one will be the private ownership in Taiwan. The second one will be the local election. I mean, we have the local election regularly since the uh, 1950s. So that is, a pre that is a very basic characteristics of Taiwan's democracy. And as shown in, I mean, in uh, his um, statement, and reunification of China 
is always a Chiang Kai-shek's priority. He said, I'm firm in my faith and conviction by rallying our party members, military personnel, and civilians, we should recover our lost territories and restructure our nation. Wow, I mean, sounds like he, is a, he has a so strong mind, right? And, um, well, unfortunately, um, he did not fulfill his dream I mean, until he died, uh, even he died. And uh, after a succession of power in uh, 1987, Jiang Jingguo initiated a series of measures of uh, political liberalization. Jiang Jingguo's tolerance, especially uh, toward the uh, establishment of the opposition party, Democratic Progressive Party, that is pretty significant. In uh, September 1986, in Grand Hotel, the DPP, uh, they decide to form the opposition party. Actually, that is a kind of illegal formation. You know, uh, the political elite within the KMT divided into two several camps. Uh, some um, hardliners de decide to, they suggest to arrest uh, those opposition leaders. But uh, other uh, softliners, they're thinking about, well, probably we should wait. And everybody's waiting for the Chang Jingguo's response. And uh, he, do, he do not say anything about and after two weeks, and uh, he do not mention any words about the Democratic Progressive Party. But we know his message, he said, he decided to turn his blind, blind eye to the formation of Democratic Progressive Party. Look at this citation. This one is pretty, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, most cited. To make these changes, the ruling party must adopt new concepts and new method and on the basis of the democratic and constitutional political order, push forward measures of reform and uh, new, renew, renewal. I mean, everybody know his decision and he decided to turn his blind eye to the formation of Democratic Progressive Party and he also abolished martial law in the following year. And uh, I will going to look at uh, uh, the, the I mean, his successor, Li Denghui's uh, his ideology. You know, uh, Zhang Jingguo, he has a very serious diabetes. And uh, he died in January 1988. And uh, Li Denghui took over the presidency in the, uh, 1988 and continued the democratic reform since uh, Zhang's face. And, um, you know, uh, he, um, in uh, 1995, Li Denghui was uh, invited to back to his alma mater, uh, Cornell University, to deliver a speech talking about uh, Taiwan's democracy. And uh, he was named it by the New York Times as uh, Mr. Democracy, and even nominated to be the Nobel, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize candidate. And uh, he, I mean, he, when he talking about his belief in promotion of democratic and Taiwan's central <coughs> ideological values. He said, after the war, that's, that is what it means, uh, World War II, it was also difficult compared, to, com compared with uh, before. It was not so much dif uh, discrimination, but it was a rule by yet another group of occupiers. I mean, in his, um, in his talk, in talking about the difference between the Taiwanese and Menenders, and, um, well, anyway, that is, uh, I would say, although the quotation um, uh, which I presented probably not inclusive, but I would say they roughly presented a rough picture about the Taiwan, I mean, those uh, perceptions and style of these three political uh, leaders. Uh, I'm not sure, do I have time? Two you should, two, two minutes. Okay, um, all right. Um, I still have uh, three factors I have to talk in about, but I have to go to through very quick. You know, uh, by the end of um, uh, 1948, um, actually that is a typo, um, uh, it won't work. Anyway, uh, okay, uh, in 1948, uh, KMT has about uh, four million uh, party members. When they retreat to Taiwan, that is only uh, 34,000, that is about uh, probably 1%. Uh, 
of the party members removed to Taiwan. That is cited from the Professor Huang Defu, I mean his research published in 1996. And uh, you know, after his completion of the construction in 1959, 19, I'm sorry, 1952, roughly three, uh, 30, 300,000 uh, party members. So uh, he tried to establish all party branches all over the island. All right. Uh, well, I, I bet you can see um, the figures. Okay. Uh, so uh, actually, conclusions can be drawn from the party members. The first one, in order to actually the KMT's uh, party structure reflect kinds of the grassroots and try to recruit more uh, party members within the party. And the second conclusion, the second conclusion we can find out is, uh, you know, uh, KMT moved from China back to Taiwan and lots of his party members uh, uh, were mainlanders, but he decided to do more political recruitment and uh, try to recruit more Taiwanese uh, memberships in, within the party. And we can find out the part, uh, Taiwanese members account from about 40%. But uh, when we comes to the uh, 1977, I mean, the, percent, the percentile rise to 56%. And by the end of the 1990s, I mean, the percentage of the Taiwanese uh, party members increased to about 70%. And the, the following one, I'm going to be talking about the elite composition. And we can look at, uh, actually, there are two organizations who will be the men in power within the KMT. That is the Central Committee and the Central Standing Committee. But I bet I'm running out of time. No, so. no, please. You sure? Please. Yes. Yes. OK. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. All right. Uh, we can find out that is a central, central committee. Roughly, I mean, uh, we can find out the total numbers of the <coughs> members, we also can find out the percentiles of the Taiwanese people. And there is another indicator I'm, I would like to talk about is uh, the, the party members from the military. Generally speaking, when we find out somebody has a military background, it means uh, those people tend to be much more conservative and pretty much more hardliners. Another one will be, uh, well, I'm sorry, you have a hard time to read. I mean, the people from the parliament, it means that they, are, they have the representative background. Generally speaking, we will find out those people from a parliament representative, they are much more liberal and tend to tolerate, uh, the, tend to have the political tolerance. All right, so uh, we can find, actually, I have already presented all of the figures, I mean, uh, within the uh, KMT's central committee. And the next one could be the, oh, okay, I'm sorry. The next one could be the much more important. It will be the KMT's uh, Central Standing <coughs> Committee. You know, uh, let me, right, you know, there is about 10 people within the Central co Standing Committee. I mean, you can imagine, you can think about this. Only 10 people, they are really men in power. They, they, they do make the critical decision within the KMT. And that is, of course, that we, we have to look at their background, right? Still, we look at, uh, I mean, his background about Taiwanese people or mainlanders. You know, in the earlier times in, within the KMT, there is no anyone, I mean, his background from Taiwanese people, all right? Uh, we also look at the percentiles of um, military and representative. Generally speaking, we can find out the backgrounds I mean, have the, the, the members of the Central Standing Committee, I mean, they have the uh, Taiwanese background. I mean, the percentage is increasing, obviously. And uh, the, the people having the military background, I mean, they have the high percentage, but it's decreasing until about uh, only 5% by the end of the 1997. But they have about 60% at the beginning, all right? How about the, uh, the, the people, the members from uh, the parliament, parliament, for example, the Congress? I mean, it is about the 40%, but by the end of the 1970s, the percentile, the percentage increased to about 70%. Anyway, uh, I have um, one, uh, one uh, factors I should talk about, but I'm pretty much sure I'm running out of time. I'll come back later if I'm still available. Thank you very much.